So we're going to go ahead and get started. Good afternoon, everyone. It is great to see so many of you joining us for the inaugural Open Texas Conference. I am Michelle Singh, the Assistant Commissioner for Digital Learning for the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board, and I am thrilled to bring greetings to all of you from the co-organizers of the event, the Digital Higher Education Consortium of Texas, Digitex, Texas Digital Library, and the Texas Higher Education Coordinating Board. Putting together an event of this magnitude is no easy task, and we are truly grateful to our conference hosts, the University of Houston Downtown, Houston Community College, and Houston Area OER for their tireless efforts in making this event a reality. We are we're thrilled to see so many of you join the networking and welcome sessions this morning and the active engagement that occurred during the fantastic breakout sessions that followed. We have an amazing program with phenomenal speakers and experts from across the state this all thanks to our wonderful program committee who also worked tirelessly to get you an amazing program that you would benefit from and would help progress OER movements in the state. We encourage you to stay connected and connect with as many people as possible as you attend. Open education efforts in Texas are on the rise and it is attributed to the work that you do every day. Whether it be simply talking to someone about what OER are, collaborating with someone to produce or curate OER, or creating opportunities like this for groups to share their OER successes and challenges. You are the reason that Texas is a leader in this space and will continue to be moving forward. The state stands behind you and the work that you do in this area. In the last year alone, more than 3 million state and federal dollars were allocated specifically to promote quality digital learning and OER development. We encourage you to take advantage of these opportunities such as grants for module production, course implementation and development, the ability to work with technology assistant partners that are experts in the field, OER elements academies and webinars, institutional framework assistance, and much more. The state also recently launched an OER digital repository in the fall, OER Texas, which I'm sure several of you are already actively involved with. This was designed to facilitate the curation of OER used frequently by Texas institutions to support the creation and customization of resources to meet the needs of Texas and beyond. It was there created to strengthen the OER community through one platform that already exists in Texas. And we're happy to say that people outside of Texas are recognizing the effort and pretty much the powerhouse that Texas has become in this area. We invite you to join us tomorrow for the State of OER in Texas panel, which is scheduled at 1 p.m. to learn how you can have access to these resources and programs and get to participate in and get involved. As our speakers mentioned this morning, OER has highly impacted access, equity, and affordability. What it had also done, and extremely powerfully, is fostered creativity and community by bringing thought leaders and experts from around the world together to share and build resources to further higher education. The world of digital learning is expanding and has more visibility today than ever. Through the power of digital learning, we have been able to bring together over 1,100 participants from across the state and beyond to today's event. A true testament to the dedication to innovation and the spirit of unity of the Texas higher education community. We understand that life over the last year has been interesting to say the least. We have tested our limits from a pandemic to hurricanes to a winter storm, we have seen our share of trying events. These events have highly impacted the way that we educate and the way that we learn. But a facet of digital learning has been a solution for academic continuity through each of these intense situations. It is in these times of trial and great stress that we truly are at our best in digital learning. This is when the decades of proven effective practice come to light. And thanks to your dedication and the dedication and commitment that each of your institutions exhibited and continues to engage in on a daily basis, we persevere through. But we do more than just survive online. We thrive, have done so for years, and will continue to do so in the future. And now comes the fun part of our journey. We now get to work together to help define what the higher education landscape will look like in the future. We have an opportunity, an opportunity to be the pioneers and influence what comes next. And I know all of you are up for that challenge. 
Change takes time. It takes resources. It takes strategy and vision. It takes advocates. But most importantly, it takes champions. Champions like you. Thank you for being the innovators, the advocates, the change agents, and the leaders of OER and digital learning in Texas. Now let's keep that enthusiasm going that we've started with this conference and get to the reason you're here today, which is our amazing keynote address. At this time, it is my pleasure to welcome Dr. Judith Sebesta with Digitex to introduce our keynote speaker. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Michelle. Just a bit of housekeeping before we get started. Please ask questions in the chat and we'll get to as many as possible after the address. Captioning is available and a recording of this, as well as all of the proceedings at Open Texas 2021 will be available after the conference. As the head of an organization that primarily serves the 50 public community college districts in Texas, it gives me particular pleasure to introduce our distinguished keynote speaker. In 2010, Dr. Dirion Pollard assumed leadership of Montgomery College, a three campus community college with 55,000 credit and non-credit students. Her decade long leadership of Montgomery College has centered on advancing academic excellence, ensuring access to higher education, partnering to build strong communities, prioritizing a deep commitment to equity and inclusion, and protecting the lifelong mission of community colleges. Dr. Pollard formerly served as president of Las Positas College in Livermore, California. She served on the American Association of Community Colleges 21st Century Commission on the Future of Community Colleges and the Commission on Academic, Student, and Community Development. Dr. Pollard is a member of the Equity Advisory Board for Mission Partners, and the Center for First Generation Student Success Advisory Board for the National Association of Student Personnel Administrators. Additionally, she serves as a mentor for the Aspen Institute's Rising Presidents Fellowship. Dr. Pollard was named one of Washington's 100 Most Powerful Women by Washingtonian Magazine, won a 2017 Academic Leadership Award from the Carnegie Corporation of New York, and was a recipient of a visionary award by the Washington Area Women's Foundation. Her tireless work on issues of racial justice has been honored recently by awards from the Maryland Black Chamber of Commerce and the Latin American Youth Center. But perhaps most importantly, in her own words, who am I and what do I bring with me to this work? I am a proud Chicago Public Schools graduate former food stamps and public assistance recipient, first generation college completer, motherless child and boy mom healed by parenting, loved and loving the most glorious woman in the world for over 30 years and proud advocate and warrior for all things community college and the students and communities we have the privilege of serving. It is such a privilege for me to turn over this session now to Dr. Pollard. Well, thank you, Dr. Sebesta. That, that was just a, a thoughtful and, and very caring introduction. Uh, I, it means a great deal to me that you thought deeply about what to say about my presence here today. And the thing that I love the most is the ending that you put in there because those are my own words about who I am. I think it's important to know what we bring to this work, how we choose to show up so thank you so much for inviting me to be a part of this. I have to say, I actually kind of feel at home uh, to a certain extent. I have a lot of dear friends in Texas. And in fact, my younger sister, uh, well, we'll say younger sister, moved uh, to Texas just a couple of months ago. Uh, and we have been experiencing what it means to have relationships across the miles. And we're learning a lot about 
uh, Texas, and I'm particularly learning through her. So it's a wonderful opportunity for me to be here. And I do apologize up front today, speaking of my sister's day is her birthday. So I'm going to say happy birthday to my sister, which is March 11th, not 22, 2022 or one. A little change there in the typo, but uh, thank you all for having me here today. I hope that you all, and it was referenced earlier by Ms. Singh in her introduction, uh, some of the, the things that we have been recovering from, and certainly you in Texas, recovering from the terrible storms that have been here. Uh, my own college was without power for a couple of weeks in 2012 after a derecho. So I know that this is not an easy thing to come back from. And we know the storms are just one more challenge for many of you on top of so many other things that have happened in this past year. Today, I want to suggest and offer to you that the tests that we have faced this year have made us more open to possibility. They have made us more aware of inequality. They have forced us to work together in some new ways. They have inspired us to think about solutions in ways that benefit everyone, not just the privileged. And this year has forced us to evolve in new ways even faster than could have been imagined. And I believe that open education will play an increasing role in how we think differently about the processes that lie ahead. A next slide, please. Many of you may know that Montgomery College has been a champion of open educational resources since 2017 when we started building a three-year grant uh, from the Achieving the Dream uh, program uh, to pilot them. Now, our primary motive was to reduce the cost for students. Uh, we were strategizing about achievement and completion, and the cost of textbooks kept coming up as a barrier. Next slide, please. We serve a large number of low-income students at the college. About half of our 8,000 plus Pell Grant students come from families making less than $25,000 a year. So five to $600 a semester in books might turn away students from class. In fact, we know that it did. Next slide. Uh, poverty continues to be the greatest barrier to education. Not potential, not promise, but poverty. And we heard this from our students. They will say they would enroll in a class, uh, but they couldn't afford to buy the books because they thought they could get through the class without them, or that they could use copies that were on hold in the library. Well, we simply know as educators, this approach has a lot of limitations that students don't always realize until they're well aware that the course that they're in is going to be difficult for them to succeed without that. And they usually end up performing poorly. So we decided on this pilot to test theories about how many students would embrace this new format and how well they would do academically. When we saw just how many students were gravitating to the Z courses in the pilot, we were astonished. Uh, next slide, please. In the aggregate, we were serving, we were me, serving, saving students a considerable amount of money. And we began looking at student success in these courses, it outpaced courses in traditional sections within the institution. Next slide. So this was another driver. Students in Z courses were not falling behind. And in some cases, they were learning better. Tackling the achievement gap as well is a priority for my organization. So we OERs have become a tool that is not just a financial one, but an academic one. Next slide, please. By this point, momentum has been growing for open educational resources, not just for the achievement, but for the quality of instruction. A faculty were discovering that they had more resources at their disposal than they ever realized. Uh, they came to see that their pedagogy could be more stimulating, drawing on video, music, and interactive presentations. Uh, they began to see the imperative to use, improve, and share. It was building communities among faculty who were in different departments, even at different institutions. They also began to push students to think about their work in the context of their communities, urging them to partner on actual social problems that could benefit from their research. Students were thrilled with this approach. In fact, many reported they had rarely had learning experiences that felt so real and had inspired them so much. 
So as OERs gain traction at Montgomery College, students want, wanted more of them. Next slide. In fact, students were quicker to adapt to them than we realized they would be over four years. And we made five degrees completely available with no textbook cost. Um, next slide, please. In business, communication, criminal justice, early childhood education, and then also in uh, general studies. These could all be completed without buying a textbook. Z degrees is what they're now called at our institution. It was clear to us from the start that open educational resources could boost access. We had to prove to ourselves that it could sustain achievement though, which it did. And those two together became a powerful driver for boosting completion. One of the surprises of OERs has been the faculty response. Now, I'll be honest here and say that not every one of our faculty has been interested in OERs or eager to leave textbooks behind. I often talk about fleeing the tyranny of textbooks. Some folks didn't buy into that. Uh, and that's okay. You know, I, I was in the classroom myself for quite a number of years, and I understand the balancing act that one has to have as a faculty member to write learning outcomes, create syllabi, grade hundreds of papers. I was an English faculty member, and then make sure you're meeting the goals of your course and certainly of that of your department. If you pile something on top of that, which feels more like additional work, people can turn off, they can reject that. So I'll, I'll get to that in a minute. Next slide. But the vast majority of our faculty were very much committed to the social justice principles of the community. So the access angle became a hook for many of them. They were willing to put in a little extra help and also check out OERs and see what they were all about. Then we had a fantastic team of what I will call OER evangelists. Uh, Dr. Mike Mills, who is our Vice President for E-Learning, Innovation and Teaching Excellence, and Professor Shinta Hernandez, uh, Faculty Chair of our Sociology, Anthropology, and Criminal Justice Department, they were tireless in promoting e OERs. They hosted workshops, learning communities, recruited anyone who could contribute their knowledge and resources, including experts in instructional technology. And they were very strategic in appealing to the social justice angle of OERs. They reminded our faculty that OERs really do save students more money and promote achievement, two ideas in our mind at the same time. But there's also something much larger at stake here, student success in the workforce. Changing the culture of our institutions so that the curriculum and pedagogy feed cutting edge student learning is the long game here. And this is no longer a luxury for our students. Even before the pandemic, the pressure to prepare students for jobs that require teamwork, critical analysis, and certainly interdisciplinary strategies has been accelerating. At Montgomery College, we partner regularly with industry boards on how curricular changes can help students perform better in the workplace. We know that you do this as well at your organizations. So we have been hearing for a long time from our business partners about the needs that we have in trying to improve and enhance our curriculum to meet their expectations. And for years, their messages have been very clear. Now the question is, well, we were listening to them, but their messages were very clear. Many students graduate with a degree, but without the skills that are necessary to help them collaborate and to communicate. They can perform in their narrow discipline, but they need to use effectively those skills in wider environments where people have different training or come from different backgrounds. That's where open educational framework comes in. Uh, faculty in our open educational fellowship have to work across disciplines so that they have the experience they're trying to teach. They have to tackle real world problems. Our group decided to use the UNESCO Sustainable Development Goals as a focus. Next slide. And this was important because they wanted to make sure that their work was connected to actual challenges. This kind of collaborative work on real world problems is certainly one that allows our students to experience the relevancy of our educations. And it also, I believe, is the future of education. 
assignments that actually collect knowledge or test new theories are also the future. Next slide. Now, higher education is becoming less of an intellectual exercise and more of an actual laboratory for progress. We need to be more efficient, more creative, and more forward thinking than, has, than we have been actually in the past in some areas. Community colleges and even four-year institutions that serve low-income students are uniquely poised to accomplish that because they understand the social justice imperative. We've learned this from our students. Their need has been our greatest teacher. Next slide. At Montgomery College, one third of our working students lost their jobs in the first two months of the pandemic. 40% of them had their wages go down, many of them in service industries. And when we surveyed them about food insecurity, a full 44% reported not knowing if they would have enough to eat. Next slide. These realities that our students face every day these students know that they have to pivot quickly or they will be left behind. Next slide. The sense of urgency that has not always been present in higher education is alive in our students' lives. Food, pantries, mobile markets are essential for our students in order to survive. Next slide. Our students don't take much for granted. Those in the Clarksburg Correctional Facility know that they will need every skill that they can get when they are released. Here's a photo, a couple of photos from our graduation ceremonies, which I can tell you included families and mentors. And there's often a lot of tearful Thanksgiving taking place there. Next slide. Our immigrant students rarely take things for granted as well. This is a picture of one of our community engagement centers started to serve our Ethiopian community, which now has the highest number of foreign born graduates. Our DACA and DREAMer students have been continuously reminded in recent years that they don't have the right to be here. So they know the urgency of skills and we are redefining that narrative that has become so pervasive in certain circles. What has created another imperative in this past year has been our national reckoning with racial injustice. Next slide. To be accurate, this is a reality for many of our students long before it became broader consciousness with cell phone recordings. But the brutality of police violence that we witnessed over the summer and continue to witness even to this day has created a new urgency for people of color. Actually, I might offer for all people who believe in justice. Next slide. But for my students, it has been a painful reminder of their exclusion from the safe existence in our communities and from the equal opportunities in our society, many levels of existence. If higher education has ever created an illusion of safety or, or of inclusion, the violent images from the summer ruptured that for many of my students, and probably for several of yours as well. They injected a terror that my faculty heard over and over again in Zoom calls and support groups where hundreds of students gathered to process the emotion of those months. This violence was not an abstraction for them. They see their own faces in these photos. Next slide. Because I believe in teachable moments, I interviewed our local police chief about the policies and department practices of our multicultural community. Next slide. It mattered to have a man of color speak about his dual consciousness in a police department facing civil rights challenges. I also brought an extraordinary public defender with 30 years of experience to talk about racial disparities in sentencing. Jeffrey Robinson, the deputy legal director of the ACLU, who shared his thoughts on the history of race in America. He is not only a practitioner, but a historian who melded those two worlds in some very powerful ways. Next slide. And finally, I had our public health director, Dr. Travis Gales, talk to me about vaccine hesitancy and disparate outcomes in COVID infections. Next slide. 
Dr. Gales has taken some courageous public stands with respect to state mandates, which have placed him in toe to toe with political factions. So his voice has been a model of racial justice and inclusion. Now these were timely, relevant conversations that happened in the middle of crises, because that is often when we learn best. In some ways, they might be classed as renewable assignments, ones that I hope add value to our world. In a certain way, I was creating a classroom that imitates the structure of open education. It was free, collaborative, and accessible to the community and addressed real, socially relevant problems with tangible impacts on people's lives. Now, I'm hardly alone in such design. In fact, Montgomery College is filled with innovative approaches to making education real and relevant. Next slide. Our Boys to Men program is just another example of an education community designed around a cohort model that models men of color and find and supports them in finding their way to achievement. It's about more than just academics. It's about belonging and relevance. Now you might be surprised at what a powerful motivator Chuck D of Public Enemy can be. Open education sees the student as a whole human being and the learning process is one that is rooted in complex social and racial dynamics. We shouldn't ignore those and expect achievement to grow organically. Next slide. That's one reason that we've partnered with Apple in our county to set up free computer coding camp, a campus for low income middle schoolers who might not be exposed to career paths. Next slide. We realize that education doesn't just happen equitably if we don't take the intentional step to provide that opportunity. Now, one of the things I love about OERs and open education is that they take responsibility to create educational experiences that are both inspirational and also that improve quality and improve equity. One of the things that came even more apparent to us as a result of the pandemic was the economic vulnerability in which our students exist. Next slide. Even with some truly extraordinary efforts to support students, we distributed over $6 million for rent, food, technology, and utilities. We still had students showing up on our closed campuses to use Wi-Fi in the parking lot. I know several of you can raise your hand to say that happened because there was no internet connection in their home. Uh, we still had students telling us they were going to do their homework on their cell phones because they had no computer in their home. And we still lost students entirely. That is what really keeps me up at night. When we went remote uh, emergency as a result of this, there were about a thousand students who didn't show up on screens on the other side. With phone calls and text messages, we got about 400 of them back, but 600 were lost. And I still worry about what happened to those students. The digital divide is another space where many of us weren't aware of our students' true vulnerability until the pandemic. But this is an area for institutional growth now. If we want to talk about equal access, it must bridge those technology gaps that exist. We must build partnerships that can solve these challenges. And I know that there are conversations going on about this at the K-12 level and in quality matters and instructional design spaces. So hopefully this will create a tipping point in which connection will be provided to students the way public schools provide books to students. In a strange way, the challenges of this year have pointed us to weaknesses to which our society has tolerated for far too long. Racial injustice and police abuse have simmered for decades, but have not claimed center stage the way they did this summer and fall. Health disparities have existed for centuries, but the pandemic has suddenly made them more relevant to everyone. Educational inequities have long existed in many communities, but dramatic underemployment has made them much more threatening. The confluence of these events has reminded us all of our vulnerability. Next slide. Even our democracy 
and which we take so much pride in has come under attack. Community colleges and many four-year institutions were anchors of social justice before these events. Our institutions have long stood for access and equity. We have fought tirelessly to close the achievement gap. The open education movement, I believe, is another powerful tool in our shared collection, and it needs to become even more apparent. Next slide. Social justice has to be built. Improving opportunity with OERs and with cutting edge curricula will serve our students in need. Inspiring faculty to take their pedagogy to a different level so that it inspires and provokes is another. Creating learning communities that tackle real world problems would drive students to connect classrooms to action and to prepare them for the next phase of our recovery. Next slide. Our students can be agents of change and our institutions must empower them. I am so grateful that so many of you are here today willing to tackle this issue and to understand just how pivotal open education is to improving our classrooms. And if we're really, really, really lucky, it will take significant gains in improving the quality of life that we exist in our families, in our communities, and dare I say, in our world. I wanna thank you for having me here today and I will welcome an opportunity to engage in some questions and dialogue and reaction uh, to the comments that I offered here today. Thank you so much. President Pollard, thank you so much for those inspiring words. And I do wanna invite the attendees. We have a few questions that have come in that I'll get to in just a minute. Um, but a, a few observations, if, if you'll indulge me, Dr. Pollard. Uh, number one, on a personal note, very gratified to hear about your background in the humanities. Uh, I know you have your undergraduate and master's degree in English and have taught, as you said, for a number of years in English. I, uh, my background is in theater, actually. I have a PhD in theater. I taught for many years in theater. So it's just very gratifying when you learn about a leader of either a community college or a university who has a background in the arts and humanities. But you know, the second thing that really struck me, Dr. Pollard, about your words is the democratizing potential of open education and how it can support equity and diversity. And so I really appreciate that emphasis on that. I think that this is a, a very important part of open education. It has been in the past and it has to be moving forward. And then the last thing I'll say, and then we'll get to, to, to questions from the attendees is just, uh, you know, I, I think all of us in Texas very much appreciate at the beginning of your remarks, your empathetic recognition of what we in Texas went through last month with the winter storms and what we continue to deal with in relation to that. And then also the pandemic that all of us are going through. Um, I think that that what really struck me in, in, in relation to empathy is just your your and clearly your colleague, colleagues at Montgomery College, your empathy for students and the challenges that they face and how open education can help, can help overcome those challenges. Particularly, you know, you talked about including some of the most, uh, supporting some of the most underserved populations such as incarcerated students, such as dreamers who hopefully with the new administration will have um, an easier time of it moving forward, we can hope. Um, but it, it's just in, incredibly gratifying to hear you talk about supporting those students and the kind of empathy that you're, the way that you all are turning empathy into action. That's not always easy to do, but yet there at Montgomery College, under your leadership, you were doing that. So thank you very much. You know what, I, I really appreciate your recognition of this and, and your, your comments, I, I think, are so um, thoughtful and I appreciate the, the way in which you were able to uh, synthesize those, those observations. A, a couple of things I would offer in response to that, which I think are, are pretty provocative if I could offer. Uh, when I first arrived in Montgomery County, I was doing like much many of you have in your communities, a local leadership development program, Leadership Montgomery. And we went to spend the day in our local jail and we toured and we were hearing about this. And mind you, the jail administrator for a number of weeks had been trying to get an appointment with me. And we were, I said, you know, I'm gonna be there. Let's take some time. I'll sit with you at lunch. And I sat with him and he would start talking about this idea of significantly expanding 
what we, our presence there in the jail. And I said, okay, I'm going to put this on my to-do list. Mind you, I've been at the job, you know, six months at this particular point. And when you're new to this role, everybody wants to partner with you on everything, right? Um, and I said, but we went in and they had a very sophisticated uh, thing. They allow people to tell their stories to us. So they had four of the incarcerated learners there and they had us break into groups. And we simply went and spent 15 minutes with each of the young men, there were four young men, and tell their stories. And they told us how they arrived in, in to be incarcerated. They told their stories, what types of challenges they had. And one of my colleagues who was in the room, who's a good friend of mine at the point, by that point said, what do you plan to do so that you're not here again? And they paused and to a person, to a person, and I, they didn't know who I was because we didn't introduce ourselves. They said, um, I'm going to Montgomery College when I get out of here. I'm going to Montgomery College when I get out. I'm going back to Montgomery College when I get out. And I looked at uh, our, our Warden at that point and I said, Warden Green, you got me right then. And he said, I didn't plan this. I said, I know you didn't plan it. I could tell because they didn't know this question we were gonna ask. And we started an intensive program. It's probably the first community engagement center that we have in Montgomery County where we went and said, let's set up a presence in the jail. Let's go in and start delivering instruction. And we do it through open educational resources in partnership with the jail. And it has been life-changing because here's a dirty secret, y'all. Higher education, before it was a series of buildings to be managed and faculty and staff to be hired, higher education was a movement. It was about equitable access, at least for us in the community college space. And as a result of that, what I have suggested to my institution, if we're going to be the most relevant community college in the country, which we want to be, our job is to figure out how to turn ourselves inside out. For 75 years, we have been doing exceptional work at bringing people to us. They have come through our doors, they've met their goals, they've transferred to some of the most uh, you know, esteemed institutions in this country. They've gone into work. We have alumni in every state of this, of this nation and far across the globe. But what we have to do right now, what I think the OER movement is about, is about us taking this value proposition that we say to our students in our community, come to us and we will educate you and we will give you these wonderful textbooks and we'll have this phenomenal instruction. What I've suggested to us is that our mission now is about how to take what we do so well into the spaces and places where they don't feel it is accessible to them. So we keep thinking, we have a number of new immigrants who come into our community. We were named by the Chronicle last year as the most diverse community college in the continental United States. We, we lost to a couple of the Hawaiian schools. You know, They got the weather, they got the pineapples and they get to be the most diverse. But we say continental United States, Montgomery College, and we, glorify in this thing called radical inclusion, that no student is expendable and every portion of our community belongs to us. So we think that we've become these bastions of access. We forget that for a lot of folks coming into our communities, we, we are still too bureaucratic because you got to fill out your application. You got to see a counselor. You got to go and do a, a financial aid form. You got to get your registration. You got to take your placement test. You got to go and buy your textbooks. You got to figure out what building to go into. Oh, you can get a coach, but you got to figure out how to get to that. All the things we think we were designed to help students will do, what we've ended up doing in a lot of ways is taking, we, we bureaucratized access <laughs> in such a way that it's no longer there. So I, I really appreciate your thoughtfulness about our efforts to say, we know we do good work and those students who come to us, but our job now is to take our message and take our mission into a different space than where we have typically been. And that I think is the work of open education and OERs for sure. Thank you, Dr. Pollard. You may not have pineapples, but you've got incredible crab cakes. <laughs> yes, we do. <laughs> You are right about that. But on a more <laughs> note, you know, you mentioned turning higher education inside out. Mm. And, and, you know, one thing that the pandemic has forced us to do in many ways is exactly that. And, you know, some of the things we may not keep around post pandemic, but there are many things that I myself am hoping that we can that will help support more equitable access to education, more equitable completion, student success. We can hope that that might be the case after the pandemic. 
Yeah, I, I, I think your point is well taken. You know, I, we've been talking in my college, a lot of our folks are saying, when we come back, when we come back, and I keep saying, quit saying that. I said, because we, 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 one, we never went away. We just went into remote spaces. And what this has given us permission to do is to accelerate some of the things we should have been doing all along. Uh, the fact that we have not, in a lot of ways, we used to design our institutions for the students and community, but over time it shifted. And a lot of that was designed around, I think, the people who worked at the organization more so than the people who came to us, our customers, dare I say, and we'll put it out there. I know some of us don't like customers. So I think part of what we've had to do in this space is to think about how do we make services more 24 seven? How do we use artificial intelligence to support student questions when we can't be there to answer that? How do we start to put coaches and what we, here's a beautiful breakthrough moment we found. So we had these coaches that we have special programming to help students who were uh, trying to navigate the academic system and they were in there with faculty and with students. But we were saying, okay, you'd come on campus and meet at five o'clock or you'd meet with them in the library. Well, guess what? The library has, has been closed, at least in terms of face-to-face. -face. A five o'clock may not be working well because the student now is trying to do their work if they have a job. And now we start seeing coaches and students, they were meeting at nighttime, 10 o'clock at night, and it worked for them, and they're doing it through uh, open medium. Uh, our uh, dis uh, uh, services for students with disabilities, they were sending, we were actually sending equipment. We found new resources to make available to students and to merge those together with the faculty and the program. It has made us be more innovative in ways that I thought it would take us years to get to. And this idea, again, of turning ourselves inside, I heard a pastor say this, I was working with them and uh, he was saying he'd taken over this church and he went, they done, they done some research and they found out that about 75% of the services and functions that they had at that church, they were doing it for the people who were in the church. And the pastor, the new pastor came in and said, we've got to be doing something different. We should be going out and taking our services and our programs to the community. So his phrase was, we turned the church inside out. And I said, ah, I'm still in that. How do we turn the college inside out? So it's about us ensuring that, here's this thing, y'all, we were created community colleges in, you know, 1946, the call for this, that, you know, if you look at what happened in the Truman Commission, think about what was happening to them. If you read the introduction to the Truman Commission, it talked about the fact that we were a nation that had racial divides. We had very clear economic disparity. We were lacking a national identity. We were struggling to figure out the economic security of the future. I know I've got some historians in here. I'm a humanities person. But when you go back and look at that, I would offer to you, I suggest, that we are in the same exact moment. And what the Truman Commission did is it called for higher education to help reaffirm the national identity. And it talked about every sector, what the R1 would do, what the teaching institution do, what the comprehensive, and it called for the creation of a network of community colleges because they knew that locality of education was important. So here's this thing, y'all. How do we now, what's the next iteration of the Truman Commission for higher education? I dare say this COVID-19 is this moment. So I, I don't have a lot of uh, patience within my organization when people are saying, well, when it gets back to that, eh, y'all ain't going back. Okay, because the students that we had, many of them are not gonna come back. They can't afford to, or in many cases, their lives have been too traumatized. They have other options that they can pursue. And we have a whole lot of people coming into our spaces. So the contraction that we're seeing nationally as it relates to higher education enrollment, this is not going away anytime in the near future. So we've got to think differently and deliberately about how our organizations, uh, they say don't waste a good crisis. So here's, here's this thing I, I heard um, this quote, and I, I have, I call these post-it note meditations. If y'all can see my monitor, I've got about a dozen post-it notes all around it. And when I need something, one of them says, be a warrior today. I need to protect my, my peace and grace. My well-being is my birthright. But there are two that I, three of them that I have right here front and center. This is not a transition, but an evolution. So this is a leapfrog moment for higher education. How are we going to show up, y'all? Are we going to be so busy trying to go back and do what we did to verify and validate who we were without thinking about how the world has changed? How are we going to show up? This is a not a transition. It's an evolution. The second one I have on here, don't panic, just prepare. So some of us have been 
oh, the sky's falling. The sky. It has been rough. Yana had storms. My sister called me we were trying to figure out how to keep, we're from Chicago, this idea of a freezing pipe and we didn't even understand. I said, well, you got to go and turn the water on. You got to, we trying to figure, so I get it. We, we, had, we, we have had COVID, a pandemic, a global pandemic wreck, wreck havoc on families. We've seen families disappear because of this. We understand the impact that it's had on black and brown communities. So we know what's happening here, y'all. So we have, do we just say, oh, we're going to go back to the way it was? No, we, we, you get a moment to kind of pause but you also got to figure out how you're going to prepare. Here's the third one that's on here. And this is a long response to this reaction. I apologize, but I heard, and I know I've got some sports people in here somewhere. Wayne Gretzky, somebody asked him how, why he was such a powerful and a prolific scorer and how he was able to do it. He says, and I have this one on here on my post-it note. Everyone else skates to where the puck is. I skate to where I think the puck is going to be. OERs, open education, you all are skating to where the puck is going to be. But here's what I'm gonna need y'all to do. I'm gonna need y'all to get a lasso and bring a whole bunch of more people with you. Innovation can't be an add-on. It has to be something we do. It has to be something we are compelled and called to do. And we have to be vulnerable. We have to step out of our comfort zone. And most importantly, people like me need to shut up and let you do this work. So let me be quiet because I didn't, I got on, my caffeine kicked in, sorry. <laughs> That's quite all right. I think we all understand. But in about the nine minutes we've got left, Dr. Pollard, let's go to some questions from our uh, 242 attendees in this session. Oh, very great. gratifying. We, we got one early on that's a kind of pragmatic question about something you mentioned earlier in your, in your address. Does no textbook cost at Montgomery College include no cost for things like My Math Lab or WebAssign? Or do those costs get rolled into the cost of the tuition of the course? Yeah, they are typically rolled into the cost of the tuition of the course, although I will offer to you, we've been very deliberate because as an institution, we, uh, now what I should also tell you, Montgomery College, we are in Montgomery County, Maryland. It's a very wealthy community, uh, but has high concentrations of high wealth and high poverty. And some of the things we do, we're well supported by our county that believes in education. So as a result of that, the resources that we have, we try to, and they actually, and sent us not to put those costs into students. So a lot of that is a part of our operational costs. In some cases, some of our OERs, um, they may be not um, no cost, they may be low cost, but for us to list them in our course catalog, I saw a question that popped up. We do it by section numbers and we have a special listing. So students know, students that uh, courses that start with this particular number are OER sections and they're listed very differently in our catalog. So students are able to know our schedule. So they're able to find that. So yes, in most cases, the college bears the cost of it or where we can, if it's at an individual uh, course level that may be at math lab, I'm pretty sure we do ourselves. I'm trying, we had a, a big controversy about that not too long ago. I shouldn't say controversy, we had to work through it. But uh, sometimes it may be at the course level that a student may have to pay it as a part of a fee, but we try to resist doing that to the extent we can. Thank you. And here's another question. Are there any publications, videos, et cetera, sharing your success and the results with your students that we could share with administrators at our institutions. Oh, that's a great one. I, 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 I'm sure there are, and I don't know if Dr. Mike Niels, uh, who is from my college is uh, in here uh, in our space, but I'll make sure uh, maybe Dr. Sebastian, if we can, I can connect Mike Niels to you and he can then have uh, some of the examples that we have. We have a couple of things we produce through our work with Achieving the Dream and a few other spaces. Um, but I, I think that's a great idea. If sure. we have, I'll make sure they put, do some, but I know we have. And maybe we can get those out to attendees in the chat feature in open water um, before the conference ends. Um, so we'll see what we can do. Thank you. Thank you. And I love this comment from Daniel Bartholomew, by the way, open education, well, he's quoting you, open education sees the student as a whole human being. Powerful, powerful indeed. Thank you. And, Carrie Ajo says, I'm inspired by your emphasis on pedagogies of care. Mm -hmm. Do you have advice for connecting the open education champions on our campuses with the folks addressing student basic needs and security, such as food, housing, et cetera? You know, interesting you should say that. I, I, I'm of the opinion that these folks seem to find each other, but it has to be around an organizing framework. So I think, unfortunately, what we've done oftentimes, and, and I don't know how your organizations are, 
um, are structured, but we, we say, okay, your academic affairs and your student affairs. And what we're trying to do at our college is kind of do what we call boundary spanding types of work. And all of these things, we identify certain themes of work that become relevant and we bring these task force together. So when we talk about basic needs and securities at our organization, we can't simply just talk about hunger um, and it can't just be about a food pantry. So these, that, that to me is, is, is the first level of the work. When we talk about basic needs and security is how we start talking about, as I just described earlier, the whole student, the student who has to feed him or herself and her family, that has to have housing for him or her, her, her family, has to have transportation, needs technology support. So how do we as an institution look at building relationships inside the organization and then partner outside of the organization to amplify this work? And that's what has happened within our organization, if we kind of identified, and as a president, my job is to, I believe, create a vision and then get out of the way. And I do that very intentionally. So we have a lot of real uh, intentional work that's being done to say, how do we start to look at the entire student and meeting that student where he or she is, and then be, or they, and being very deliberate about the fact that as a college, we can't just simply say, you know, go put your poverty on display and have them walk around the organization. We need to triage very differently. And here's the other thing that I'm gonna tell you that I think is kind of amazing about this. I'm also of the opinion, we've starting to redefine our relationship with external entities as well. So as I said earlier, when you first come into an organ, every place I walk in Montgomery County, county of a million people, everybody says, oh, I'm a partner with Montgomery College. And I said, oh, really? Okay, what's that mean? That means I bought a table at your chicken dinner and you bought a table at my chicken dinner. Uh, that may mean that we list each other as partners, but we had no outcomes. We had no way of measuring our impact. And to be quite frank, we weren't having a shared agenda, but we were partners, right? So we have changed our model. We're moving. So we're having this idea of partners and then we're also moving to allies my part i'll still have a certain number of partners that i'm going to have to have because of the optics and the political nature of the organization but i want allies and those allies then i able to partner with the capital area food bank in our area which is now saying Darian, we want to put a pilot program through we'll still support your mobile market we're going to help put in these refrigerators so students can just come pick up food and community but here's the other thing they do they also are saying, how do we start to incent workforce development? So if we take out some of these barriers of student not being able to pay for rent and food and transportation, and we give them a weekly stipend and put them in an accelerated course of study that allows them to be able to get entry-level work and also then have career laddering. Oh, and by the way, these programs are using OERs and open education to do that. We have then brought all of these folks together. That requires a different level of work than just simply saying, oh, and by the way, you know, uh, we, we got a food pantry. I, I'm about tired of that. Somebody here said real college and me, me and Sarah is a good friend of mine. I talk about this all the time. We got to stop talking about food, pantry. just like we got to start talking, stop talking about uh, food. Uh, what do you call that? Um, food thing when you have cultural food exchanges and that's your diversity work. Come on, people. That's introductory level stuff. You, we have to start thinking at a high. We are smart people. We came to academia for a reason. Just use our brains in a different way. I don't know about everybody else, but I myself very much appreciate your bluntness and your honesty. Sorry, that, 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 I turned 50 this past year. I think that has something to do with it. <laughs> yeah, but it's been a couple of years for me, but that certainly was a milestone in that regard. We are nearing out of time, but, but let me just one more question that we've got here for you. And I apologize that we won't be able to get to, to all of these great questions. I bet I speak for everybody when I say I wish we could have a happy hour later on and pick Dr. Pollard's brain a little bit more. But Laura York expressed something similar to what I did. Thank you very much, she says, for discussing supports that the traditionally underserved populations are receiving through your efforts. I'm interested in your approach for people with disabilities in this environment and any findings that you may have for replication. That's a big question when we only have about two minutes left. But I, And I'll be quick on that. Thank you for, I love how she's so good at moderating that in this space. Uh, we have done a couple of things. We've created a new center that's looking at accessibility with technology. So we uh, built and brought a team of internal people together that are creating standards for us in this space as it relates to this. And then we also have a very robust uh, area of college that supports students with disabilities. So those folks are coming together to make sure that we're not leaving anyone behind. If no student is expendable, 
and every portion of our community belongs to us, then our job as a college is to make sure we're meeting every student where they are. So it's about those coalitions that I talked about momentarily and then connecting our resources and institution and being very deliberate about what we can do. And I'm very pleased with that. Uh, I saw somebody found Dr. Michael Mills. He's on the team that's actually helping us to do this work around our center uh, for accessibility and our technology. And here's the other thing, holding ourselves accountable. So we just did board policy around this and put together a set of presidential procedures to help guide the work as well. Wow. Well, again, I apologize that we weren't able to get to all of the questions there. Um, just and really- we are doing things with faculty and staff. I just saw that pop up the disabilities. Our uh, presidential committee around equity inclusion has a special focus this year on employees uh, supporting employees with disabilities. And that has been groundbreaking because unfortunately, oftentimes what we do is talk about students. We don't talk about the lived experience of employees and they have brought that to our forefront. I'm sorry, I'm done. Thank you though. Thank you very much for bringing up that important point. Dr. Pollard, on behalf of the Steering Committee for Open Texas 2021, on behalf of the Program Committee, and I think I can probably speak for all of the attendees today, thank you so much for this inspiring speech. Take good care, all of you take good care, and please enjoy the rest of this conference. Thank you, and have a good one. You too.